live, where news comes first. This is ABC7 Extra. Welcome to ABC7 Extra. Good evening. I'm Maria Garcia. Glad you're with us tonight. Well, remember when the city of El Paso tried to pass that nearly half a billion dollar quality of life bond? It was and is a big deal. Voters approved it. Lots of investment and debt for our community. Well, as we've told you, starting tomorrow, voters will decide if they want to pass a bond almost that big for a school district. The Estera Independent School District says it needs $430.5 million of debt to pay for new schools, renovations, upgrades, and some closures and consolidation of campuses. We're going to get to the details of the bond tonight. YISD asked voters to approve a slightly less expensive version of this bond in May, but it failed at the polls. So the district, hoping this month will be different, and it's also continuing, counting, I should say, that Proposition 1 will help convince voters. It would increase the exemption homeowners can claim on their taxes, which means some homeowners' tax bill would still be lower even if YISD's bond passed. Joining me tonight, YISD Superintendent Dr. Xavier De La Torre and parent and volunteer Patrick Brown. You can email us your comments and questions now to abc7extra at kva.com. You can also reach us at 915-496-1775 on Twitter. You can use the hashtag abc7extra when you tweet me at mariagabc7. Part of the challenge for YISD, with an aging population, many older residents in the district are on a tight income and aren't necessarily convinced approving such a large bond is the right move for them. Our education reporter, Ashley Rodriguez, filed this report. So many of us are uh, elderly and to the point where our children have been raised and they're gone, grandchildren are raised and gone. This Eastwood resident declined to go on camera, but was more than willing to share why her elderly friends voted against YISD's bond election in May. We don't see the need uh, for investing in the community further. And that's true, by the way, of the 65 and older. YISD will have an uphill battle to climb as it tries to sell a repackaged bond this November. A $430 million bond means a 14 cents tax rate increase, or $66 more per year. While parents want the new schools and technology promised for their kids, we got to look at it as a big picture. It's for our children, it's for our future. Older residents aren't buying. People our age tend to get a little more cautious with their money. The last time YISD residents invested in the schools was 2004 under Superintendent Hector Montenegro. From 2009 to 2013, Dr. Michael Zolkowski led the district and oversaw a failed bond effort in 2010. He pitched only $160 million for new schools and refrigerated air. Current Superintendent Dr. Xavier De La Torre's pitch will cost more than twice that, and older residents aren't feeling the urgency. I, you know, I can only speak for my tenure and the time that I've spent in the district, and, and I've seen a lot of people who acknowledge uh, that we've not addressed the needs at our schools and uh, that they're not getting any better and that they're excited about someone coming in with some energy and some enthusiasm. And joining us now, YISD Superintendent Dr. Xavier De La Torre and parent and volunteer Patrick Brown. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We appreciate it. Thank you for having Thank us. Uh, so, Dr. De La Torre, um, as we mentioned at the beginning of the show, the city of El Paso uh, a couple of years ago asked voters to approve a $470 million quality of life bond to improve the quality of life for the entire city. And, and you're asking voters to approve nearly that much uh, to improve the third largest school district in the city. Why so much? Why not a more palatable amount? Well, I think there's there's some misconception that uh, we're trying to uh, address all of the needs at once. Uh, people, I think, sometimes are taken aback when they find out that the $430.5 million is actually about a third of what we actually need in the school district. So we are taking, I think, uh, a smaller step uh, toward what we believe uh, not only our students need, but our students deserve. And if you want to improve the quality of life in a community, you need to invest in, in education, in this generation of students who are going to guarantee uh, the kind of economic prosperity that this country has enjoyed for almost two centuries. It isn't done through you know, parks and projects. It's done by educating uh, generations of students so that they can uh, be part of the, the economic uh, machine 
uh, that has made this country so great. You heard from a voter in that opening piece saying, you know, I'm on a tight income. I'm not sure voting yes on this is financially sound for my home or for my community, especially when there are tax increases from other taxing entities. Uh, sometimes there's fatigue from voters. They feel they're being asked to pay more from other avenues. And so what do you say to voters who say, um, I don't think I, I want to approve this. It's, it's too much, and I can, it's not good for my household. I, I feel that now more than any time is the best time to approve a measure just like this. Um, to me, it's like all the stars are kind of aligned. Number one, Esleta has a uh, additional Homestead Act that nobody else has, which is saving the taxpayer in that district a lot more than everybody else. We're the lowest paying district in, this, in the area. And also with the Proposition 1 coming up, voters now ha actually have a chance to vote yes for both and actually see your, the majority tax rate go down and get the kids what they need to have a quality education. Uh, but even if YISD, if the bond passes with Proposition 1, uh, it could actually save people on a fixed income a significant amount of money. But aren't they missing out on how much money they could really save? I mean, if, if without the bond, if it was just Proposition 1? Well, there, there are two things. First, uh, we have to do a better job of educating our elderly. Uh, when we uh, conducted uh, uh, when we conducted a survey after the narrowly defeated bond in May, uh, we were dismayed to learn that 50% of voters 65 years of age and older were unaware that their property taxes would be frozen for the purpose of supporting the Islet Independent School District. Uh, almost half of them were also unaware of the fact that uh, they enjoyed a 20% local homestead exemption and that they've enjoyed that homestead exemption for two decades, since 1994. So. I can certainly understand being on a fixed income, I can certainly understand being on a pension, and the one thing that the board and I and all of us at the Islet Independent School District never want to do is be cavalier or dismissive about somebody's financial reality. But uh, to Mr. Brown's point, if there was ever an environment uh, more conducive to considering making an investment in your school system, it's now. Uh, speaking of how big the, the bond proposition is, why hasn't Isleta invested before this? I mean, why so you're saying, you know, the $430.5 million is only a third of what the school district needs. It sounds like YISD should have been taking care of its facilities a lot more in the past. That would be true if homes and buildings had eternal life cycles, but the reality is even schools uh, at some point reach the end of their life cycle. And when you're a school district that has been, in my opinion, the best option for families and students for a, you know, for a hundred years, for a century, you simply have to come to the conclusion that some schools, whether you've made the right investment, whether you've managed monies appropriately in the past, at some point in time, schools like homes need to be replaced. I want to talk about the biggest expense there. Uh, the biggest expense there, $93 million for Eastwood High School. Mm -hmm. Eastwood High School, some would say, is like the crown jewel of Isleta. It's so popular. There are children from other district boundaries coming into YISD to go into Eastwood. Uh, it's overpopulated. Uh, so why not invest in other campuses to make them as attractive as Eastwood is? I don't think that Eastwood is attractive because of the facilities. I think Eastwood is attractive because at present, I believe Eastwood may be uh, the highest performing comprehensive high school in the city of El Paso. And you're right, we do get a lot of students who do not live uh, in the Eastwood attendance area or even in the Islet Independent School District. But we have faculty and staff there to support 2,300 students. If we were to limit the number of students who could attend Eastwood, then we'd have a personnel or a staffing uh, challenge on our hands. And those teachers that are at Eastwood uh, do a terrific job. Uh, that performance doesn't happen by accident. It's done by design. Uh, it's done uh, with a spirit of excellence by design. And we're very proud of all of our comprehensive high schools, but Eastwood High School, uh, as you've mentioned, seems to be very popular in the El Paso community. But academics-wise, why not invest in making the other high schools, Isleta, for example, academically as intriguing and as attractive as Eastwood? 
And again, I would argue that uh, Isleta High School has an amazing environmental science program. Beller High School has a one-of-a-kind uh, health magnet uh, program. All of the high schools have something that's unique and special about them. And I believe that my predecessors, and I certainly will continue to invest in all seven learning communities, we're only as strong as our weakest link. So we want all of our high schools to be very, very attractive. And so they all do have very unique magnet programs. It happens, it just so happens that uh, Eastwood is one of the more established comprehensive high schools in the area. And it uh, draws uh, students, families from outside the area. And it has increased the enrollment from what would normally be about 1,700 students to about 2,300 students. So. We, we appreciate having the additional 600 students, especially when you're a district that's uh, been in a pattern of declining enrollment mm -hmm. for two decades. Right. Let's go to the phone lines. Jesus on the west side is on the phone. Hi, Jesus. What's your comment or your question? Uh, my question is for Superintendent Javier de la Torre. Uh, I'm just wondering why the voters should approve such a, a large bond issue when El Paso is a very poor city. And what will be done to reduce uh, central office administration uh, in order to ensure trust in the community. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I have to tell you, every time we have a superintendent on the program, we get a similar question from viewers about uh, administration and how you're tightening your belt and, with and that. I, and I think our efforts are well chronicled. I know that we've spent uh, at least the 18 months that have been, or that have made up my tenure, uh, pursuing a flatter, leaner central office and redirecting uh, our human capital out to the, to the school sites. And how exactly? So what we do is any time that we have openings at school sites for assistant principals, for principals, uh, for teachers in some cases. We take staff from the central office and we reassign them to the schools that have those openings. Uh, another example would be the elimination of positions whenever uh, we get the benefit of positive attrition. Positive attrition refers to retirements, resignations, promotions, people that relocate. We simply eliminate those positions behind them uh, to make sure that we always have a balanced budget. So if you look at the central office 18 months ago and you compare that uh, to today, what you'll find is, is that we've cut and recaptured millions of dollars uh, and in some cases have re redirected that investment to the schools. Uh, relative to uh, his question surrounding um, why the voters should do this, well, I often, uh, well, I, I believe strongly that uh, you can uh, tell the character of a community by how they invest in their youth and in their elderly. And I think that the single most important uh, issue of our time is improving our public schools because, again, they're going to drive the economic prosperity that we will either enjoy or not enjoy in the future. And it's going to affect and impact every one of us. So the reason we reinvest in the Islet Independent School District is because we've gotten flatter and leaner at the central office and because this bond is actually the genesis for the closure and consolidation of schools that are, f that are grossly underutilized. Uh, let's go to Norma on the east side. Norma, what's your comment or your question? I heard that um, voting, voting no for the proposition one for the ex homeowner's exemption, it's not going to help us. It would be better to vote no. Well, then how are you all now saying that it'll be better to vote? We're going to keep continue having the discount, a bigger discount than voting for the proposition for the state independent school district. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Norma says she uh, seems to be a little bit confused about how to vote on Proposition 1. She says she's been advised that it would be better if she voted no on Proposition 1. Uh, and any, would, do you want to respond to Norma's question? Proposition 1 is basically going to increase your homestead to another $10,000. So right now I believe it's $15,000 and it's going to go to $25,000, which means you're paying less tax. That money is taken off of your tax base of the value of your home. So when you vote yes, you're actually lowering your taxes on your home. So when you vote yes on Proposition 1 and vote yes for the bond, you're actually still lowering your taxes and getting the kids what they need for a quality education and outstanding facilities. Uh, but if somebody voted yes on Proposition 1 and no on the bond, they could save more money. They could. Their taxes would go down a little bit more, yes. Yeah. So, so then, for again, for voters who say, 
I want to take advantage of the full benefits of Proposition 1, and the YSD bond takes away from those benefits. Uh, what's your response to that? My response is, the children to me are more important than saving a few cents. Now, I, I get it, you know, I, again, I don't want to, you know, say that money's not important, but the education of our children are much more important than that. And I don't feel that you could put a value or a cost into providing what the kids need. Um, I've been around these schools. I was, I was um, blessed to be part of the uh, committee to see, see what the $430.5 million is. Right. And I went to these schools, and these schools are literally falling apart. There's rust. You know, I was graduated Eastwood High School. That was over 25 years ago. And I go there. It's way worse than it was. I mean, there's watermarks. There's, there's wires, exposed wires everywhere. Um, and that's not just at Eastwood, it's all the schools. And it's come to a point right now that we need to realize that we got to take care of our children, we got to take care of our community. And sure, we can save a few bucks in our taxes, but what we're not going to do is we're not going to see our children's future forward. Okay, we have to take a break. When we come back, uh, we're going to take more of your phone calls and tweets. You're watching ABC 7 Extra. Remember, you can call us at 496 1775, email us at abc 7 extra at kva.com, or you can tweet me at Maria G. ABC 7. We'll be right back. Welcome back to ABC 7 Extra. We're talking about the Isleta Independent School District's $430 million bond that voters will get to approve or deny starting tomorrow with early voting. Uh, we have with us Dr. Xavier De La Torre, YSD Superintendent, and Patrick Brown, who is a volunteer. Uh, the second most expensive thing on the bond, $87.1 million, would be a combination elementary middle school that would replace Camino Real and Valley View Middle Schools and Mission Valley Elementary School. Uh, and the new merged school would be named Del Valle Middle Mission Valley Elementary. Uh, so what would happen to the campuses that YISD would close to, to build this new merged campus? So it really just depends on the campus. In that particular case, what we'd like to do is we'd like to close Camino Real Middle School and sell the property. Uh, the students at Camino Real Middle School uh, would uh, be consolidated, assimilated with current students at Valley View Middle School, and there'd be one Del Valle Middle School uh, for approximately 900 students. And it would be a combination school similar to what uh, we did when I was in the Socorro Independent School District. Uh, there's an economy of scale by creating combination schools. I think the important thing is to make sure that uh, the public understands that that doesn't mean it's a pre-K-8. It means it's two separate and distinct facilities with two administrative offices, two um, parking uh, facilities, so on and so forth. But that's an example of what we're trying to do that is somewhat unique, and that is we're not moving a group of students from one tired, weary school to another tired, weary school to save a million dollars. Nothing that we're doing has anything to do with recapturing money exclusively. The idea is to try and close schools, but to give those students a brand new facility that provides them with a 21st century learning space that they need, and more importantly, that their teachers need to provide them with the kind of education they're going to need during their lifetime. Uh, Cadwalder Elementary School also on the list possibly to close if this mm -hmm. bond passes. What would happen to that building? So Cadwalder, because it's unique and uh, uh, historical value, uh, would likely be re purpose to support uh, adults who uh, have special needs and who we work with to provide uh, skills so that they can be employed in our community. That school is currently called TLCC. It's located uh, at the future home of Bel Air Middle School that will accommodate the closure and consolidation of Ranchlin Hills Middle School and Hillcrest Middle School. But Cadwallader would continue. The students at Cadwallader would consolidate and be part of the brand new Thomas Manor Elementary School. That would be a brand new elementary school in the Riverside Learning Community that would accommodate approximately 800 students. Okay. Uh, so for the merger school that would combine um, Camino Real and Valley View, uh, you mentioned the campuses that would be closed would probably be sold. Uh, so it sounds like there's not a really incredibly concrete plan on what would happen to these campuses. It's the communities around these campuses often become alarmed when they think of an empty building with no real concrete plan of what's next. Well, we have a concrete plan, but uh, the one thing that uh, I have to keep in mind is that I work at the pleasure of a school board, and there are seven individuals on that school board, and it's likely that there will be elections uh, between now and when we complete 
the uh, the Del Valle Middle School project. So I, I can't take liberty and make decisions on behalf of the school board. I know the school board we have right now is thoughtful, deliberate, uh, and is aware of our plans, but uh, they ultimately make the final decision. But our recommendation would be to close Camino Real level uh, and then use the proceeds from selling that property to offset any debt that we may be uh, we may incur. Now, with the ten thousand dollar potential ten thousand dollar increase to the homestead exemption at the state level, uh, there really isn't any debt. That ten thousand dollars is negating the twelve cent increase to the current property tax. So, in this case, what Mr. Brown is talking about is that the state of Texas wants to help the Isleta Independent School District reinvest $430.5 million for students, faculty, and staff, and wants to invest $430.5 million in the El Paso economy, and that has never happened before. And what I mean by that is, a lot of people think that the 12 cents generate $430 million. They do not. They generate $215.25 million, or half. Why is that? Because the state gives the local entity, the local municipality, $1 for every dollar that we generate. So the state's already paying for half of the bond. Now the other half of the bond was supposed to be paid for with that 12 cent increase to the property tax, but that 12 cent increase has since been uh, put into question because if we pass a $10,000 Proposition 1, it negates the 12 cents. So what you're looking at, you're looking at a situation where the entire state of Texas wants to help this school district rebuild, reconstruct, reinvent, an experience for 41,000 students. Uh, definitely is a very unique situation for voters. Let's go to Jessica in Canatillo. Jessica, what's your comment or your question? Yes, uh, why aren't uh, current money and materials being used instead of asking for more money? I am uh, aware that there is a lot of materials and uh, Promethean boards even that are not being used, where other districts do have those available and they are being used. Thank you. So Jessica asking uh, about resources that the school district is not utilizing to their fullest potential. Uh, if Jessica can point out where we have these interactive whiteboards or Promethean boards, we'd be happy to install them, but the reality is that no such whiteboards exist. We uh, currently receive uh, $365 million a year to operate the school district. The majority of those funds are already dedicated to salary, health and welfare benefits, statutory benefits, transportation, instructional materials, and all of the things that we need to operate the school district. Uh, any notion that there are things like interactive whiteboards or Promethean boards that we are aware of and that we are intentionally not utilizing to support students is a distortion of the truth. Let's go to Daisy in the Lower Valley. Daisy, what's your comment or your question? Uh, yes, my question is, uh, why isn't all the schools in the uh, East Little Independent School District uh, being uh, benefiting from this uh, uh, bond? And why is it taking 32, uh, 38 years to pay off this bond? Thank you. Thank you very much, Jessica. So wh the first the first question, why aren't all the schools in the district benefiting? All the schools in the district are benefiting. Every school that we plan to operate in the future is receiving an investment. Uh, the bond note is a 30-year note. Uh, how are all the schools receiving an investment? How will you know how to allocate that? Well, it's driven by the Jacobs Engineering Report. It's driven by recommendations that uh, were made by the Facility Advisory Committee, the Equity and Enhancement Subcommittees. The investments are being driven by data. The investments are being driven by need. It isn't uh, a plan where we've decided to allocate uh, a set figure for each one of the 63 schools in the district. We don't plan on having 63 schools in the district. We plan on having closer to 48 schools in the district at some point because we no longer have over 50,000 students in the district the way we once did. We have 41,000 students. So in many cases, we've got schools that can accommodate 1,000 students and they've got 300 students in the building and it's costing the district anywhere from $800,000 to $1 million to operate a school that is being utilized at 30%. So some schools aren't going to get much because those schools aren't going to exist in the future if we adhere to our facility master plan. And again, it's being driven by the data, the need. 
and not all schools were built at the same time, so it's impossible to believe that all the schools would have the same needs at this point in time in their existence. Okay, uh, Rebecca tweeting at us, will this bond cover everything or are you going to come back and ask for more money in a future bond? I'm going to come back and ask for more money in a future bond. This is about, uh, almost about half of what we need to take care of all of uh, the needs, but these are the priorities. And one of the things... Now, earlier you said it was about a third. Yeah, so is it a third or a half? It's about a half of what we have in our facility master plan, but about a third of what we need as a district. Our master plan goes out about 10 years. Okay. Uh, when will you come back and ask voters for more money? Well, what we'd like to do is we'd like to do four things. We'd like to make sure that all the projects that uh, are listed on the bond are built on time, under budget, the quality that we expect, and that the majority of the labor is done uh, here. Uh, from contractors and subcontractors in the El Paso area. I think if we do that and people see tangible evidence, then I think the trust and confidence in the school district will increase significantly. When that happens, I can come back in seven, eight, nine years and ask them to consider extending the note on the current bond, and that means we're not going to ask them to increase their tax. We're going to ask to go out beyond 30 years so that we can secure some additional monies, much in the same way that you would if you had ac equity in your home and you needed some additional money to remodernize nice. We'll do the same thing, but we won't come back to the voters if we haven't delivered exactly what we promised as part of the bond. Uh, Jim tweeting, is there a plan to guarantee that the, mo the bond money allocated for a project goes to specifically that project and not something else? There is, and uh, we're in the process of identifying uh, a cross-section of members in our community uh, that would make up uh, a bond oversight committee, people with background in construction, people with background in finance that can hold uh, the administration and the district accountable uh, to make sure that everything that we've presented to the public as part of the bond remains the projects in the bond. Okay, we have to take another commercial break. Uh, we're going to keep on taking your phone calls and your tweets when we come back. Uh, we're getting some comments from viewers about uh, the district encouraging students to vote over the age of 18, so we're going to talk about that. You're watching ABC 7 Extra. We'll be right back. Back to ABC 7 Extra. We're talking about the Estada Independent School District's upcoming bond election. Uh, Valerie had written to us and she asked, is it legal for a taxing entity, let alone a school district, to openly advocate for a self-serving tax increase? And she's talking about uh, students being able to receive, receive community service credit hours if they were willing to pass out information on the bond for the district. Um, you know, you said that this is simply an informational campaign. It's not supposed to influence the vote uh, but there are some viewers who told us they feel it's sort of an ethical murky ground to have students to incentivize students uh, by giving them community credit hours to pass out information that is informational but that still makes a pretty convincing case for the district well, I think the first thing that is true is that uh, this district, this administration, uh, our principals do have a strong interest in seeing more and more people, not just students in El Paso, participate uh, in uh, elections, bond or no bond. I think uh, what we've been very careful to do is make sure that people understand that we are prohibited from doing anything that could be interpreted as an attempt to compel, coerce, or persuade a student or an adult uh, to vote in any one way. And so we've been very clear uh, with everyone and with everything that we've sent uh, to employees uh, and people affiliated with the school district that that simply cannot happen. Whether or not uh, students should be given uh, hours, and that's the credit that we're referring to because they're not getting credit in the form of a grade or anything like that. Students in these lead independent school district uh, can select how they generate 80 hours over the four years that they are our students. Um, if students ask uh, or request to participate, uh, we feel like uh, giving them hours is a legitimate uh, thing to do. We've not, and we've made sure that no one has gone out and campaigned for them to use um, increased voter registration uh, as a means to generate these hours. I will tell you that what we're working on is a partnership that was initiated not by the Islet Independent School District, by, but by Senator Jose Rodriguez, who I think uh, we all support and we believe, as he does, that voter apathy has gotten out of control and that more and more people need to understand that there's a civic responsibility to have a voice in decisions that are being made uh, on their behalf and on uh, our behalf as a society. So we don't apologize for any of that. 
and, and there is research, obviously, that shows that the younger you vote, uh, the more prone you are to vote the rest of your life, the, the more it becomes a habit. But, but I, really, I really think that the question here is, if you have somebody in, as an authority figure, a, a district official who's an authority figure to these students, um, talking to them about the election coming up and how they could vote and what it means could they, that how they could vote, that the dynamic seems a little bit unfair because these are authority figures within the district. We'll just have to agree to disagree. Uh, that's not my opinion. That's, that's what I've heard from students, but uh, not from students, but from viewers. Um, from Ernest, what's the long-term plan for debt servicing? Is that when taxes go up? Also, Eastwood has newer buildings as well. Will those be torn down? Uh, relative to Eastwood, no, the new buildings will not be torn down. Uh, we will rebuild about 90% of Eastwood, uh, but the science labs that were recently uh, built will remain uh, on the campus. Um, we would never be that dismissive with our taxpayers' um, contributions. Uh, the second thing relative to debt service, I think is what Mr. Brown is talking about. At least in the immediate future, if Proposition 1 passes, there is no debt. Taxes mm -hmm. are going down for most homeowners in our school district, not up. Uh, and also uh, another email from Rosa. Please ask uh, Dr. De La Torre if there is documentation on their website of all the positions eliminated and how much monies are being saved. Not on the website, no. Where can, where can the public find that if they wanted to look for that? We can do an open records request. We can do a before and after. We can identify the positions that uh, have been eliminated and redirected uh, to the schools. We can do it any and all of that for them. Okay, uh, and another email from a viewer. Why aren't more campus administrators paying more attention to the physical maintenance of the school? Also, why is a good portion of the proposed bond going to athletic facilities? And I believe it's $55 million. Are we here to educate or promote ath athletics in our schools in YISD? We're here to give students an incredible experience. And uh, in our society, athletics are important to people just our visual and performing arts important to people and academics what we try to do is we try to make sure that there is something for everyone we happen to be the last school district in El Paso County that hasn't installed the artificial surface at each one of our seven comprehensive stadiums and I think that's eight million dollars right of the 55 million going toward no, athletics. No it's more than that it's probably closer to 14 million dollars okay. in artificial surface uh, the lighting on the baseball fields and the softball fields replaced tennis courts uh, replaced basketball facilities uh, so uh, those projects um, are important to the experience that students have in school and, uh, and again I want to reiterate something that uh, people tend to forget because it is unique to this uh, bond and that is the administration didn't develop this bond we are not the authors we are not the architects of this bond this bond was developed by some of the same people that helped defeat the bond in May and only agreed to participate in the process because they wanted to make sure that they could stop any future bond from being put before the voters. The project list that is going before voters in November was developed by 80 members of the same community. It's a bond by the community for the community. It wasn't driven by the Board of Trustees and it certainly wasn't developed by the superintendent and the administration. This is a community who came together and over an, a very short period of time uh, realize that there's a sense of urgency in addressing some of these needs. They determined what would continue to remain on the bond and what would come off the bond. There's a lot of projects that aren't on that bond that were on the May bond. Mm -hmm. uh, Ricardo saying, will any of the money be used for administration bonuses? How about for teacher <coughs> salaries? No, bond money cannot be used for compensation. Uh, this is specifically for facilities. Uh, and uh, Mr. Brown, you were you were on that committee uh, yes. that refocused the projects. Uh, what were the factors that you used to determine which which projects would be included? I, I base the factors, well me personally, I base the factors on the greatest need at the, at the present given time. The things that are most important to move the district in a, the right direction for the students, I place those as a priority. The priority for me was the safety and security of the students, the structure of the buildings, um, the learning environment, their technology aspects. You know, we're in a position now where technology is not getting dumber, it's getting smarter, it's getting better. And these f these buildings right now weren't even built for that. You walk into schools like, you know, like Eastwood or Esleta, and they got four outlets because there's four walls. 
but reality is where are you going to plug in your computer, your data? Where are you going to plug in everything else, your CAT6 cables? Where are you going to put your digital whiteboards? Where are you going to do all that stuff? That right now is what is in today's classrooms that at our district right now we have a very hard time and they're not even there because our facilities cannot support. Mm, cannot support the technology. Uh, Last week, there was an incident where uh, a man who appeared to be drunk went into one of the schools, a uh, local school here. Uh, $8.4 million in safety and security enhancements, such as fire alarms and security cameras. Uh, why so little in security, comparatively? It, because security doesn't cost that much. But one of the things that uh, that committee decided, and I was privy to their conversations, was that if we're going to convince parents that the safety and security of their children, uh, our faculty, staff, is our number one priority, then we need we need to live that value. And so what uh, we're doing is we're replacing all the fire alarm systems, security systems. We're installing additional surveillance cameras. We're putting up perimeter fencing to limit access to the campus. But the biggest thing we're doing is putting in magnetic door locks and what we call a management system at the front of every school where no one, whether they are uh, a visitor or a volunteer, can get access to the school without being allowed into the school by someone at the front office. All right, sounds good. Well, we're out of time. Thank you so much for watching thank us. You. Thank you, Dr. Della Thank, you, thank you so us. much, thank Mr. Ron. We appreciate it. And thank you so much for watching ABC 7 Extra. We hope you found this informative. Remember, early voting starts tomorrow, and Election Day is November 3rd. Thanks so much for joining us. Bye-bye.